Hi, my name is Giet Kirsten. I'm the CEO of Sellside Corporation, uh, New York Stock Exchange, CVM. We're a biotechnology company. Our goal is to make the first cancer treatment more successful. We aim to do that by using an immunotherapy as a first treatment right after diagnosis to activate your immune response to fight cancer while it's still healthy. Because once you fight surgery, radiation, chemo, your immune system is no longer healthy. And what I'm going to present to you today are results from our phase three clinical trial, the largest clinical trial ever done in head and neck cancer. Head and neck cancer is a miserable disease uh, down from under your nose, down to your clavicle, about 900,000 people a year. We haven't made much progress against it. They do horrible things such as cutting out your tongue and we need to do a lot better. And we have something very, very exciting to present to you. So what I want to start very quickly as a summary, we are going right before surgery and the other treatments. That's first line. We treat locally because these patients generally start with a local tumor. And uh, uh, so the, it's, it's in those patients that we want to stop the disease. When we get tumor responses in the short three week that we treat, meaning I will explain to you what the tumor responses are, you end up with much longer life. That is the major thing to remember here. You activate the immune system, you get tumor responses, you have a longer life. I need to show you these uh, disclaimers here, and uh, uh, but you know, let me go straight to this slide here. Uh, what I want to point out here, initially, we're going to be discussing the general population of the study, which was 928 patients, okay? And then we're going to talk about the selected population. Why do we talk about a selected population? It's because the regulators need to write a label, and that label has to define very accurately what kind of patient should get the drug, and you don't want the drug to end up in the hands of someone where you don't think it's going to work. So this is the absolute key to unlocking the survival benefit of our drug. I'm going to show you that the drug works overall, and I want to show you how incredibly well it works in the selected population, which allows the regulators to write an approval label with extreme accuracy. Um, the way Multicon works is by causing pre-surgical responses. So what is that? That's when the disease gets better before surgery. Imagine you go in with your head and neck cancer. Uh, it's a miserable disease. You have a 50-50 chance of living in five years. You may lose your tongue. You may lose your salivary glands. It's just a miserable disease. Many of the patients in our phase three study had pre-surgical responses. And about 70% of those patients lived five years or more. Um, Going from 50 to 70% survival is truly incredible, but think about it. It cuts your chance of dying almost in half. It's a, that's a big deal, and by the way. That's the gold standard for cancer drug approval survival. Um, so we may recently made a big announcement about, uh, about this, and today we announced that yesterday at ESMO Premier Cancer Conference in Europe, we presented data that we have refined the target population to really focus in on those people who have the greatest benefit because you want to make a medicine available for those people who have a truly good benefit. And that is, in fact, um, in large part, the people who have these pre-surgical responses. And what we're able to do is we were able to find, to predict uh, these pre-surgical responses so that we have, in fact, about 38% of the patients in that study population have a pre-surgical response. Let me prove this to you so you can see it yourself. So a tumor reduction is a pre-surgical response, but the definition of a tumor reduction is not just any reduction size. It must be reduced by over 30%. That's a general definition that people have accepted. It's called resist. And then the second uh, one is disease downstaging. This is more complex than tumor shrinkage, but there are guidelines that the doctors must follow. They do it all the time when they treat patients. And that means that you go from stage four to stage three or stage two to uh, one or something, you're getting better. That's the key thing, downstaging. And we have found that that is very important also for multi-kind. Now, 
Multikind clearly leads to pre-surgical responses, right? Uh, it's in the phase three data. So look on the left side in the blue column, eight and a half percent of multikind patients. This is in the whole study, including the people with chemo who didn't uh, respond well. Uh, without chemo, they responded very well. But eight and a half percent of patients had a tumor reduction. But they were zero in the control group. And that's the statistics are very, very clear. It clearly has to be multi-kind. Um, on the right side is downstaging, where the, the disease gets better between the beginning of multi-kind treatment and afterwards. And you see there's also a very clear difference. And the statistics there are also very, very strong. Anything under 0 0.05 is significant. And you see both of these statistics are very, very significant. So this is from the whole phase three study. So we know that multikine is the cause of these responses. In the target population, though, that we talked about this morning in the press release and that was presented at ESMO, the rates are much higher than 8.5% and pre-surgical responses and 22% for pre-surgical downstaging um, because we focus on the patients who are most likely to respond. But I'll get to that in a minute. We also prove beyond any doubt that if you have a response from multikine, then you will live much longer. So remember, you get a tumor response and you live much longer. This is a key consideration here. The gray column on the right side is the control group. These people did not get multikine and they had 48, 49% survival um, at, uh, at five years. You look at the blue line, and those are the people who had a um, tumor size reduction, and they had a 72% survival. And you look at the orange line, and they had a 68% survival. So it's about 70% survival compared to 49%. So as I said, the risk of death is almost cut in half. That's a key thing. The risk of death is almost cut in half. Obviously, that is very significant. <clears throat> now, here's another way of showing the improved survival for respondents. And this graph, higher is better. So what you have on the left side is you have survival probability, 100 down to zero. At the bottom, you have months. So 60 months is five years, a very, very long follow-up time period. But what you're seeing is the top line, the green line, are patients who had multi-kind downstaging, meaning that multi-kind made, their, down, made their, tumor, their disease better and they were downstaged by the physicians. And they have the highest survival. The middle line, the red line, shows the patients who had no change in the downstaging and they have much less survival. And then the bottom line is where you definitely don't want to end up so the blue line is where the people were upstaged, meaning they got worse. And their survival is the lowest. Look at it. I mean, that's like 30% survival. And we look at 60 months for multi-kind. Uh, the downstages, it's 70%. You're talking huge, huge, huge differences. So this is another way of measuring the tumor responses of multi-kind. Now, now we're going to get to the most important slide, what I call the heart of multi-kind. It shows the survival and the target population for multi-kind compared to control. And this is the selected population that we presented at ASCO. We have now the ability to predict before surgery, when you have to give multi-kind, and before radiotherapy, because it's surgery and then radiotherapy, we can predict who will be the responders. And that is the target population. By the way, it's about 145,000 people, which is a very large target population in cancer. The multi-kind survival is the upper one, the blue one. So at five years, you have 73% survival. The green line is the control, you have 45%. I mean, that is a huge, huge, huge uh, difference. And it's at five years. And honestly, I've been in this business for a long time. I haven't seen many drugs that could do this. And we haven't had toxicity issues here. And we haven't had any safety issues. 
And why, why is it so significant? How do you get such an amazing ability to predict? How is there such a difference in survival? It's because we figured out who the multi-kind responders are. Remember, responders have increased survival. We have almost 40% of these patients in here in the selected group are responders. So we know who is going to benefit from this drug and the benefit should be made available soon to them because as you can see, it could make an enormous difference in their chance of living. Basically, it cuts the risk of death in five years, almost in half. It's a huge deal. Again, you have to look at statistics. Our p-value for this is 0 0.0015. Remember, anything under 0 0.05 is good. 0 0.0015 is excellent. So you know this result to be very statistically valid and very important. All right. Here are some more details on the data on the target population. The first three bullets we've already discussed. There's 373% survival for multi-kind selected patients at five years versus 45% in the control. FDA calls that a 28% absolute survival benefit. So for them, the difference between 45 and 73, they just count the numbers in between. And we know it to be highly statistically significant. Then there's the hazard ratio. And for those of you who don't understand that, I'm going to give a little bit more explanation. Um, it compares how fast deaths happen in the two groups. So anything under one is good. Like a 0.5 is very good for the approval of our drug. We need a 0.72. And so we're at 0.35. We're really, really, really good. What that means is that the deaths occurring for multi-crime are only 35% compared to the other patients. So basically, the control patients die three times faster than the, the multi-kind patients. Obviously, I want to be a multi-kind patient, right? Then there's that number in there that's 0.66. That's the upper limit for the hazard ratio. And the significance of that is regulators look at that because it's kind of what is the worst case scenario, right? So that means that there's a 95% chance that the true hazard ratio is less than 0.66. And this uh, goes to statistical significance also. And it also means that the outcome of another study is 95% likely to succeed. So that 0.66 as the upper limit, how does it relate to drug approvals? In our study, in order to be successful, we needed to show 0.72. But 0.66 is already much better than that which we needed to show for the approval of our overall study. So that means the upper limit is still better than what we needed for approval, which is obviously very good. And in fact, that is why a leading former regulator who used to lead an oncology division in a major, major area said that he doesn't think a confirmatory study is needed. Um, so I wanna repeat again, the, the target population is so successful because it's really good at focusing on people who respond to multi-kind. The rates are high. So the tumor reduction rate is over 13% and the tumor downstaging rate is over 35%. And of course you have no safety signals or toxicities and which is very important as well. So let's talk some more about the target population. We want to avoid patients who get chemotherapy. So if you have more than one lymph node involved with cancer, then you need chemotherapy. We don't want chemotherapy. So we could have made it N1, allowing one lymph node that's cancerous. But sometimes in surgery, they find a second one, then you would get chemo. So we made it N0. We don't take any patients into the multi-kind population who have a cancerous lymph node. It would be conservative. We also don't want extra capsular spread. We saw in our phase three study that that's very bad for patients. And also, if you have extra capsular spread, if they see that in the surgery, they give you chemo. We don't want that. So we are actually, if you're N0, you shouldn't have extra capsular spread, but 
we are requesting that physicians use PET scan, which is standard of care by now, to look for extra capsules, but also we don't want that. And then we have something that really truly differentiates us. So many of you may have heard of Keytruda and Optivo checkpoints. These are the most successful cancer drugs, but they tend to work well in patients who have a large amount of PDL1 receptors. It's just simply that's how they work. That's their mechanism of action, which is about 30% of patients. Multikine, we saw and presented in July of last year at the American Head and Neck Cancer Conference. Multikine has the responders and the people who are PD1 low, meaning they don't have a lot of responders, which by the way was 70% in our study. So we are differentiated from Keytruda and Optivo, which are phenomenal drugs uh, in a key way, which is you know, the different mechanism of action, which allows us to help those patients where those drugs very successful drugs, I have to say, um, don't appear to be able to help much. So again, when you combine those three selection criteria, you end up with our massive survival benefit with these excellent statistics. Now, what kind of tests are required? The tests we're requiring are just their routine, right? This is what the doctors do all the time. Nothing new needs to be added. It's standard practice. And Therefore, it makes it really easy for a regulator to write a clear label. Remember, that's the key to unlocking the survival benefit. If you can't help the regulators write the label, meaning define the patient population that they should approve, then no matter how good the study, they cannot approve it. So that's why this is so important. And by the way, this also represents about 145,000 patients per year. So this is our plan going forward. We don't have all the answers yet, but we are pursuing the regulators in the US and Canada, Europe, and the United Kingdom. Why? Because they are the four leading regulators in the world. Uh, they collaborate all the time. Uh, for example, if Canada does a facility inspection uh, for us uh, in Maryland, then the Europeans and the Brits would recognize that completely. And I was told that the Americans recognize it mostly. So they work together and the rest of the world tends to follow. So for example, when we went for the, the, the 20 approvals for the phase three study, many countries would ask for FDA approval letters. And we said, FDA doesn't give those, but Canada does. And they said, oh, well then it's okay. Send us the one from Health Canada. So that's how, they, how they're all highly respected. And remember what we're doing is new. Uh, the data is very strong, but it doesn't always check all of the boxes. So therefore, you have to talk to people. It's always important. Talk to people, explain to them, establish a good relationship, and that's what we're doing. It's a lot more work than I ever thought. I thought you would just copy and paste. And no, you have to actually for write individual, you know, sometimes very different applications for all of them. But it's done. It's been done. It's behind us. So we are seeking approval based on the current data. And we're hoping to do it such that we can get approval. And then if they want a follow-on study, we would do that after the drug has been approved. And this has been done many times. Many of the leading cancer drugs have actually come to market in that manner. So, um, you know, a lot of submissions have been filed. More will be filed. We're working on this literally all the time. We, are, uh, we announced just recently that the facility commissioning is will soon be done and so the validation should be done by first quarter of next year that's important because it's part of the bla filing which is the marketing application and then you know so our goal then is to move forward on various uh, marketing applications once once the bla is ready and hopefully with the goal of getting an early approval and uh, in, in in many places with the requirements to do a follow-on study afterwards. And if all goes well, the earliest potential uh, approval would be for us the end of 2024. So let's hope for the best. I thank you very much. We have, uh, we're very happy, I have to say, very, very happy that we were able to do that. We wanna thank a lot of the doctors and even some of the regulators who helped push us to find this very, very good definition because I think this makes all the difference 
uh, for potential approval. It makes all the difference for physicians to know exactly who the patients are who will benefit from this. And uh, thank you for the shareholders who've been supporting us. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. On that note, we'll pass the question off to the viewers. We'd love to know what you think in that comment section below. And consider subscribing because as news comes down the wire, of course, we're going to bring it to you here. But on that, we look forward to catching you in the next one. Bye.